All right, so uh, welcome everyone. Uh, it, it's good to have you from wherever you are, are joining from today. I'm thrilled to be having a conversation with uh, former colleague and, and friend, John Buton. Um, for those of you who uh, are familiar with Forrester Research, John is a principal analyst and uh, for portfolio marketing there. And I'm really excited to have you on the call. We actually worked together a number of years ago at Akamai um, and, uh, and we've stayed in contact because I think the work that you're doing is absolutely amazing. So, so John, thank you so much for joining us today. It's really great to, uh, to be chatting. I'm glad to be here. Um, and it's, uh, it's exciting what you're doing, I think, um, creating uh, and helping companies uh, reach across the globe and do it in ways that are, that are more powerful is, is really important. Beauty. Thanks, mate. So, um, you know, since, since we worked together a few years ago, you've, you've had a number of different roles, um, you know, a, a pretty experienced history across, you know, startups, um, you know, certainly a lot in tech, you work in industry marketing, and now you're doing a lot of stuff with, with Forrester around the messaging. Can you just give us the, the couple of minute overview of where you're from and, uh, and what you're doing now? Sure. Um, yeah, I've got a nice background of an interest in technology and an interest in, in marketing. I, I got a degree in sociology. And when I uh, went into marketing, I was like, it's kind of the same, except instead of, you know, elite middle class and working class, it's, it's luxury, midsize and, and uh, economy cars. Um, and it's been a really nice match with some of my interests. I've worked at, uh, when the internet started, I just ran into that and started building websites and helping people with their, their brand presence for a consulting company and then work for a variety of technology companies, um, engage uh, our technology group, Pegasystems, and where we met at, at Akamai Technologies, uh, doing product marketing, industry marketing, uh, and corporate marketing. And throughout all of that, you know, there's a certain restless energy as we uh, continue to grow the internet and, and grow technology. And uh, sort of the next stage for me was to to bring that uh, first to Cognizant, where I was consulting with uh, startups inside the company, and then Forrester, where I get to meet with lots of different companies and, and uh, get lots of different views is, is good for somebody with low attention span. Um, so, so that's been a lot of fun. I get to work with clients in, in a range of industries from high tech uh, to pharmaceutical to manufacturing, lots of different B2B uh, companies that are just looking to take advantage of all the things that all the new marketing technology has to offer. Uh, and also, um, you know, uh, 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 cope with all the changes that are happening. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. Thanks for that overview. And what, what really strikes me is, um, you know, I guess the varied background that you've had, I mean, it, it's been certainly tech based, as you say, and starting back when, you know, through the bubble and, and all of that stuff. But then, you know, if you worked you know, with startups, uh, you work with big tech companies as well. And now uh, you're working across a range of different, different clients and, and, and different types. And like, what, what are you seeing out there as it pertains to like maybe some of the macro trends in marketing? Well, certainly in there's a different set of challenges that the big companies face that the small companies don't like the small companies. Um, and, and that really, you know, gets up to companies that are technology companies that are close to a billion dollars um, can still be pretty lean within marketing. There's still, you know, one, a handful of products and a very concise notion of your audience. And uh, that feedback loop is just got a lot of energy. The, the, um, whereas at, at these larger companies, you know, once you reach a certain scale, uh, you have a lot of um, market power, you have a lot of access to infrastructure, uh, to, to data, you have these great systems built out, uh, but you have also a lot of that inertia. And so breaking down that inertia, doing that coordination, managing to get to something really um, uh, brilliant and pinpointed uh, through all of that is really a challenge, you know, and so I think that's still the challenge for both audiences always is really trying to understand that customer. And that's gotten both easier and harder as, you know, we're getting so much more data, you know, you get so much more transactions. Uh, some of the things that we're seeing now where um, people are using a lot of guided selling or um, insight-based selling tools, 
where uh, they're actually tracking and documenting you know, each and every sales call. And in a product marketing uh, lens, instead of like having to go out on sales calls, you can sit at your desk and sit in on them or even get a transcript of all of them. You know? So you can see in real time what questions customers are asking. Um, but at the same time, you're also a little bit more at arm's length. So really trying to understand what their situation is is a lot different through a transcript than it is when you're, you know, going on site, you know, drive, flying down to New Jersey in a car for a half hour car ride, um, you know, with a sales rep and then taking the, uh, going out for, for lunch in a cafeteria with a client and really, you know, seeing what it is that, that weighs their shoulders down. Yeah, that's, that's fascinating. It, it, it is all, all, always that, I guess, fine line between like technology being an enabler um, and, and there's obviously massive investments around technology, but then also still needing that human feel. And I guess, you know, one, one of the things that, it, that, that you focus on, you work in, in Forrester, um, and one of the big things that we really wrestle with in Asia Pacific is, is around that messaging um, and about how you, you can have that corporate level messaging and you can be informed by a lot of, um, you know, potentially tech and, and market research and, and, and all of that. However, when you need to reach really specific for that micro-targeting, like you need to be effective. But how, how do you do that? Like what, what, what sort of things are, and programs are you running and advice that you give to organizations around that? Yeah, um, that's a great point, you know, because the, the buying process is different in different regions, you know, especially in Asia, you see we, we did a, um, an annual uh, buying study where we track just how the buying process worked, how many touches, how long, how many people are involved. And um, you know, in Asia, the sales process takes longer. Um, there are more people uh, involved, or, or at least it's more likely to be like a committee instead of just like a couple of people making a decision, more mm -hmm. formalized processes. And, um, and then that's just you know, in terms of the process, in terms of what the needs are, they can be really different. Um, and the example from Akamai Technologies, where we both work, was really interesting, where we were promoting speed as the benefit in, in the U.S. and globally. And for companies in, um, uh, in individual countries, uh, you know, like Taiwan, that were reaching a global market, speed made sense. But for com uh, companies that were just local to Taiwan, like speed didn't make a difference, or in, or in Europe also. So the message that you brought to market had to be uh, had to be really different if you were going to resonate. You know, we said speed, 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 and then um, it didn't make a difference to a whole host of the audience that they were trying to reach. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's that. And, that's and that, that came back, you know, from from the field, from individuals who are, you know, people that are close to the customers who you have to really listen to. Yeah, and, and what's your what's your advice? So this is something that we we wrestle with every single day um, here when working with organisations. Like you get the scalability from the global messaging, and you can call it the global air cover or whatever it may be, and 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 you get it. Is that's how you get your economies of scale, and that's where you get your direction from. Um, and we see the field's role is to provide that feedback loop. But then, like, how do you coach organisations through to actually bring that to life? Because it's easy for us to stand yeah. out here and go, "We're in Australia. Um, take this global message." turn it into this for Australia and do it back. But the ability to do that is far more challenging, particularly when you get the bigger organizations. Yeah, absolutely. And, and you want to create that continuity, you know, because it's, it's both about economy of scale. I think that might sometimes be overplayed or, or that's important. Um, but the other element is just that kind of consistency. Like, who is this company that I'm signing on the dotted line for? What do they stand for? And uh, can I count on them to, to uh, continue to stand for that? And that kind of trust relationship is more and more important. Um, people want that from a company. They want to know that they're going to be responsible, whether it's you know, uh, uh, a global climate situation or, or a, 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 a global um, disruption like where you see in the Ukraine. You know, what is this company's uh, stance going to be? How do I feel about them? And when you're saying something different from what the parent says, you know, you start creating some, some distrust. Uh, one of the things 
I like to think about is not thinking about the messaging as a, as a monolith. You know, you do have that overarching, you know, some of those brand themes. And you have that primary message. But you have secondary messages as well. You know, you're going to tap into the primary buyer need, but you're also going to touch on other secondary buyer needs and needs of specific people in the buying group. Mm. And so, uh, you know, it's a matter less uh, of, of um, trying to manage those touchstones, you know, and in some cases in Asia, you know, you might tilt that triangle, that pyramid on its side and say, you know, this one is actually the one we're going to emphasize here. Yeah. And it coordinates with what we're doing globally. Um, it just is, you know, it isn't the, the headline, it's the secondary line. And that's what we're really uh, emphasizing here and create that consistency. Um, you know, have those touchstones and and try and do them in a um, uh, in a consistent, in a coherent way. So you you're really going back to the intent of what the company stands for, rather than you know just the words and saying you know intelligent, smart, or whatever it is. What what do we mean by smart? Oh, by smart we mean you know we actually understand what our customers want, and not like don't use smart and start talking about AI or something. Yeah, 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 yeah. That's 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 really interesting um, because it, it's like, and you talk about was it was the word you used trans creation before, or what? What was yeah. the word that we were talking about about when we're developing content? Because like, you know, you have translation, and it's like we need to go beyond translation. You need to get to localization. But then you were talking about was it trans uh, trans yeah. creation. Trans creation and co creation are are two yeah. big themes in uh, in global in managing that, um, navigating that uh, um, tension between global marketing and regional marketing. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, you want to, both teams have to learn to recognize if you're gonna market globally, that you have to come to uh, great respect for each other and what you need to do. So when you're creating global themes, you know, things that we sometimes do that are clever with alliteration, you know, it's going to be the four Ps. It's not going to be the four Ps in China, you know. Yeah. Um, so uh, think about like what's meaningful rather than clever um, and really focus on those meanings. Uh, and then uh, likewise, you know, when we're local, we have to think about um, let's try and use this content, but also pick and choose where it is that we really create emphasis and make sure that it's not just the meanings, but that we're able to imbue it with, with uh, the metaphor or that, that makes it resonate with our, with our local audiences. But then there might be some areas where, you know, you need to come together where you say, um, where the global team can say, let me lean on, you know, the, uh, the Asia team on this messaging or this white paper because they know that need as well or better than we do. Mm. And that kind of respect and that kind of thought will really help because, you know, I think that the clients that you're selling to globally are global clients. And, and when you're able to elevate, you know, this is, this is really important. And the examples we see are, you know, from, from Singapore, ASEAN, Japan, you know, oh, you're a global company too. And you're, you're uh, walking the walk as well as talking. About it. Yeah. 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 Interesting. Um, and so, so the, that that concept that you talk about around the meaningful, I mean, that's that's super powerful. Um, and I feel as if what I'm getting the sense is, is I won't go as far as saying the recommendation, but the concept that that you're talking about is is, is around going what you might lose in these economies of scale with this global overarching message where you can hit the real volume play is you'll make up on the back end if you be a bit more thoughtful around the localization of the trans creation. It, it, it's it's almost like Martech has given us the ability to go really big on volume and go really targeted. But now what we need to do is ensure that we've actually got this humanness behind it to, to actually localize these messages. Is that kind of thereabouts? Uh, that's, a, that's a fantastic um, uh, summation of it. Yeah, I mean, always there's this issue of we wanna really connect with our audience and the more precise we can get, the better we can connect, but we have limits to like how much we can do that. Um, yep. uh, there's a there's a funny saying from uh, the baseball player Yogi Berra. You know, he's presented with a with a pizza, and they said, "Do you want do you want us to slice it in six slices or eight? And he said, um, 
Uh, you better give me six because I'm not that hungry. You, know? <laughs> uh, you can slice it all the different ways and it's hard to figure out how to navigate it, you know, uh, but getting more precise, as precise as you can be um, while still maintaining what you need to, uh, to be able to support is mm. really the game. And some of that's going to be, you know, choosing. So, uh, so you're going to use like um, uh, my colleague, um, uh, um, uh, Ka uh, Kathleen Pierce, sorry. My colleague, Kathleen Pierce came up with a uh, really nice study about translation um, where, you know, she really emphasizes for a lot of this atomized content, you want to create it in, um, in much more localizable way and uh, machine translate it for a lot of the stuff on the website. Um, but you're going to pick and choose places where there's going to be real emphasis where you don't want to do that. And you really want to create it, uh, co-create in, in region so that you can really make a difference and really connect. Mm -hmm. so yeah, making and, and, those choices. And, and so how, just trying to think about the opera, opera how you operationalize <laughs> that. It's getting late here in, uh, in Perth, how you operationalize that um, for it, because it obviously takes a very strategic pro approach um, and it takes a commitment of resources as well. And it's a bit, it's a real evolution, I guess, a way like how, uh, is anyone doing it well? Maybe that's what I'm, I'm interested in. I'll put you on the spot there. Have yeah. you seen anyone do it well or moving to do this well? Yeah, I think the, there are companies that are doing it well and uh, it has been a matter of, you know, creating when there are companies that are small and lean that do it well. And that's where they've got really good people and are able to move fast and have good connections. Um, also uh, able to really do what we, I like to call radical prioritization, you know, of, of getting that editorial calendar and really uh, knowing what it is that they need to do and need to do well. And then mm -hmm. also letting the rest of it happen, uh, but with, uh, with less emphasis and, and less coaching, getting to that same kind of prioritization on a, on a larger company global scale you know, you see the companies that are succeeding are doing things like creating global charters, uh, mm -hmm. um, creating um, uh, editorial calendars and uh, having local control, creating a, a lot more structure around that creation. Uh, and at the same time uh, that they have a lot of leeway, you know, mm -hmm. to be able to empower local agencies in say the social domain. Um, yeah. And, um, yeah, yeah, yeah. That's yeah, yeah. So I, I guess it's it's that centralized guidance, as you say, the charters, but then enabling and providing the autonomy to people out in region to go. These are the guardrails that we need to. And this is something that Brad Rinklin spoke a lot about as well, particularly when you're new into a region as well, is to go. This is what we're aiming for. Like here's our north star. We need to make sure that marketing and sales are very much in lockstep. And you can operate in between here, but then the rest is up to you, Field. You go and, and, and you go and do it. And I guess that comes with, as you say, these small and leaner companies have the ability to do that. But I suppose if you can set that environment in some of these bigger companies, then, then you might see them you know, be able to shift as well. Yeah. Uh, I think another element there, and you see this both in corporate marketing and product marketing, and corporate setting those brand values really strongly and helping people understand what they mean and how to act on them can really set up those, those guardrails, you know, can help you to understand like, oh, you know, we value security. And so we were always thinking about X, Y, and Z. Um, we value privacy or, or what some of those um, uh, elements are. Uh, and then same thing within uh, product marketers and portfolio marketers we get a lot of, get hung up on the messaging and what to say in that specific language. Uh, and that doesn't always translate well. You can't use that language in every situation and then you're out on your own. So really uh, being able to get to who is this buyer? What do they care about? What is the uh, uh, 
need that we're trying to understand and empathize with? What are the differentiators that we want to emphasize? Uh, that's going to be really helpful to help people understand those building blocks, uh, give them a starting point, and uh, I think you're right, a North Star on the messaging, mm -hmm. and then trust that they can find the right way to express that, to art articulate that, uh, both you know in local language or uh, also you know, to respond to local needs, uh, to respond to uh, you know, uh, local thought patterns. Yeah, yeah, certainly. Um, and then, well, we don't need to go into it now, but I guess that becomes even more critical if you move into a market where it's heavily dominated by a reseller type environment or partners. Um, mm -hmm. You look at something like a Korea where they, they are really, or South Korea where they're really dominated by the tables, the bigger, um, companies where there's a lot of reseller relationships as well. So I guess that, uh, you know, depending on how it is you're actually taking the organization to market as well is how much time you need to invest yeah. in that and, and police it probably for lack of a better term. Well, and, and there, you know, starting with the, the why, the purpose, the values is going to get you so much further because, you know, establishing what it is that they need to say Resellers is a great example because you can require training and, you know, that'll happen, you know, whatever the deadline is to enter the program, you need to have five people certified mm -hmm. and they'll do that. And that'll happen in March. And then in September, two of the five people are going to be in a different role, you know, and instead, if you can help them understand the why, you know, we exist to do this and we're going to help companies do this better than anybody else. And that should be inspire you to try and understand what it is that we're trying to do so that you can help your customers. Um, that kind of rooting into those values and that, that inspiration, that, that why, can uh, drag through and really turn the tables from um, you know, uh, demanding their attention to like commanding their time, where you're able to have them try to think rather than like look up what is it that what is it that yeah. I'm supposed to say? Yeah, you get the cut through, and you, and you get that enabler, as uh, as you say, because uh, because you can you can go in and, and and talk at that level, and then a lot of other things just become quite obvious as a result of that, as opposed to going A B C D. If you like, this is the why, and this is what we stand for. Then all of a sudden, it just kind of flows on from there. It's it's really something that uh, I think those of us with kids in the school system have seen that the way that they've sort of tried to flip the classroom and now um, through the pandemic, we've all had to experience it where, you know, you're not gonna bring people into a room and talk at them anymore. You're mm. gonna put it up online and, you know, there's always a way around whatever it is that you require people to do online. Um, so if you can inspire them to do it or create peer groups to do it, you know, you you want to start creating those situations where uh, you inspire them to want to pull down that information just in time, instead of you know this old model that we have of you know January first, we all sit in a room and we get this stuff pushed at us. Yeah, um, that's just not working anymore, and that's that's also I think uh, I think a big trend uh, yeah. that you're seeing globally. And so yeah, and and so. Mark, marketing's role in that, like, are you, are we saying, does all this result in, in marketing having neat requiring greater input cross-functionally, or has it always kind of been that way? It's just been at varying degrees. Um, you know, I look at, I look at things as an example, we, we've got that. So around sales enablement and sales training and, and, and partner enablement, but then you've also got now marketing, um, well, in getting people back to the workplace. And it's a very similar thing is, is that yeah. in the hybrid work environment, they talk about now people need to be incentivized to come back and have a reason to come back as well. And so it's, it, it seems to me there's some similarities there and their marketing's role now needs to extend into workplace strategy and HR to go, well, this is, <laughs> this is the story about why you should come back. Um, wh what are you seeing around that marketing's role, I guess, internally? That's a, that's a really interesting question. We, Definitely see that that change dynamic. I, I think some of it is around the new capabilities you have to have. So, you know, I think 10 years ago we said marketers need to understand technology and underneath need to understand statistics 
to be able to do the new digital marketing. And we, we sort of changed the set of requirements. You can't just, you know, be a creative person uh, and, um, and come up with ads. You need to really understand the numbers and engage with that. Um, and the same thing I think is happening a little bit in reverse in, in product marketing, where you need to be a much more empathetic and um, uh, uh, a, a group leader um, uh, somebody who can bring teams together and uh, a great moderator and collaborator. Uh, and the purpose of collaboration, you know, is instrumentally to learn from everybody. But actually, the act of bringing everybody together uh, is an important one as well to bind to a common purpose for everybody to get on the same page and you to be able to trust that everybody's going to uh, try to get to the same message, try to get to the same goal. Yeah. So I think that's part of it. And uh, that that's new set of that new set of capabilities. Yeah. Yeah. O honestly, mate, we, we need to do a V2 of, of this conversation because I'm, I'm super cognizant that we're getting close to time and, and, and really could just talk about uh, this this all night. And so but I do want to quickly shift gears just to the last couple of minutes as well and just just kind of throw it back to your, your work at Forrester. And and I did right. allude to this a little bit earlier. Is like what 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 cool things are happening there? I'm always interested to know. Like what what are you seeing at some of these organisations, and 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 who's really pushing the envelope around around marketing at the moment? Uh, let's see. Um, you know, we are seeing a lot of companies really transform and start uh, uh, getting some of this. The thing that I'm really excited about, I've been working on a project around portfolio marketing, product marketing's role in enablement. And, and that shift in enablement is really exciting where you're starting to see us move from this old fashioned classroom perspective to a, uh, to a new collaborative and, and some of the tools and technologies companies are using. I was talking before about um, some of the conversational intelligence where uh, you're both pushing out messaging and then you can see whether or not sales is using some of those keywords in real time and also start to see like emotionally are people responding to that are people yeah. in calls where people are hearing that message uh, responding and uh and that intimacy that response loop is just really uh interesting and exciting and and we're seeing people you know, be able to pivot, be able to manage uh, uh, so much faster. Um, mm -hmm. Likewise, you know, the response time we see in um, uh, in message testing is as people are uh, fine tuning and product marketers are working with their digital marketers to say, you know, here's the four different versions. Instead of taking that to focus groups, let's let's put them out in search campaigns and let's start to understand which words are really going to respond to. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So that that that's phenomenal. And so you you really, I guess, quantifying, like, well, well, you always start with an assumption, I guess, and that's one of the key things as as, as a marketer, as a modern day marketer, is that you, you build a hypothesis around these things. Like you have your body of knowledge, and you go, well, I hypothesize that that this is going to result in that. You can put it out there, but the fact that you're, you're hearing it back and in such a quantifiable way um, is obviously very, very powerful. And then the ability to be able to do that at scale, I would say is, is just going to be super powerful. Yeah. yeah. I'd say also, you know, in the past two years, what we've seen from companies responding to the pandemic, uh, the number of companies that were able to uh, have a good process for setting an agenda of what does our product need to do, listening to customers, what do customers need, being able to create that loop with Agile um, on the product side and some of these digital tools on the marketing side to be able to just really shift their business very quickly uh, has been phenomenal. And, you know, that's in, in companies, you know, ranging from uh, uh, video um, uh, telecommunications companies uh, like the, the system we're using, uh, you know, all the way to, to paper production uh, and uh, and clothing companies that you know had to really respond to differences in um, in tastes very quickly, and uh, it's just been inspiring to see you know how uh, how instead of telling the story about how like we hit this bottom and then we recovered, 
People were just, you know, very quick to be able to respond, pivot, transform uh, in the face of all of these changes. Yeah, yeah, outstanding. Oh, my, as, as I said, honestly, I could keep this conversation going all night, but I, I, I'm aware that you've um, we can't hang around for for uh, all evening on this. But um, look, I, I just want to say thank you so much for for jumping on. It's been a really enjoyable chat. It's just been a great catch up as well, and and having a having a good chat. If um if people want to find out a bit more about Forrester and some of the work that you're doing, is there somewhere that we can point them? Well, go to forester.com and uh, look for the blog and you'll find some interesting, uh, a lot of interesting materials there. And I've got a couple of uh, blog posts coming up on both this enablement and the messaging topic. Fantastic. Well, look out for them and, and, and we'll certainly pump them up and, uh, and, and connect with yourself on LinkedIn, I'm sure, and find out more. And, and honestly, I, I just want to say thank you for, for jumping on and um, I'm looking forward to having our next chat because there's plenty more that we can talk about. So, mate, it's been good to see you. Likewise. Cheers. Thanks.